This week on the podcast, protests across the country to end violence against women. Airline Rex goes into administration, prompting calls for nationalization. And protests erupt across India following corruption scandals around exam papers and testing for students. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellist and I'm speaking to you from Gadigal country in Sydney. This land was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. We acknowledge that this land was stolen by force and we stand in solidarity with First Nations people campaigning for justice, sovereignty and land rights. Now we've got a really exciting episode coming up. We're going to be talking about some really important actions including the national weekend of, of rallies to end violence against um, against women, um, and the airline, the small regional airline Rex has fallen into administration. So we're going to be talking about kind of why that's happened and alternatives to what could be done, um, including bringing it back into public ownership. And finally, we'll be discussing uh, this corruption scandal in India, uh, where where millions of students have been affected by. Um, corruption and exam leaks for really important um, exams that they have to take. Um, before we get started, uh, this podcast is produced by Green Left, and if you'd like to help us continue the work we're doing, um, you can become a supporter today at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It's the only way we uh, keep uh, going is through the uh, generous supporters, and we don't take any corporate advertising or sponsorship, so uh, we really need your support, so head to greenleft.org.au slash support now. It's only $5 a month, the the, the digital edition um, subscription, and $10 a month to get the paper delivered to your door every fortnight. And yeah, it's only you know as much as a cup of coffee or a, a beer, so um, it's not too expensive and makes a big difference for us. So let's kick it off with these uh, marches where thousands uh, marched across the country over July 26 and 28 as part of a national weekend of action to end violence against women. Um, these no, the rallies were called No More and they took place in more than 20 towns and cities across the country, organized kind of in collaboration with a variety of local anti-violence and women's groups and initiated by the What, uh, what Were You Wearing um, community group, which is dedicated to ending sexual and domestic violence. So... I guess the context for why these rallies were held was uh, in, in response to the continued killing of women across the country. And according to Destroy the Joint, which is a, a independent group that's been tracking um, femicides and the killing of women uh, across the country, there's been 44 women killed this year, which is almost two a week. And then um, uh, what you were wearing at the rally said there could be as many as 54 women um, killed this year. So it's pretty... It's, clearly a national you know emergency um there was a previous day of action in april that we reported on on the podcast uh that was also organized by what were you wearing and it's very uh tragic to say that there's been a, at least 17 more women killed since that uh previous national day of action so clearly you know more needs to be done the most recent um is the killing of the 23 year old Keisha Thompson on July 19 and Thompson was killed after dropping off her daughter at daycare in a hit and run that was allegedly planned by her ex-partner. So this is clearly a really uh, important issue and it was great to see so many people join the protests across the country. Um, you know rally organizers their main demands is for more community uh, more funding for community legal services and grassroots organizations and also for more uh, trauma-informed training for first responders, so police and paramedics who will be attending um, people who have been victims of violence. Um, there's also, you know, a, a lot that could be done uh, on a bigger scale in terms of, you know, things like ad uh, addressing the housing crisis. I mean, one of the key th things that keeps um, women trapped in, you know, violent situations and violent homes is the fact that, you know, the alternative is homelessness, which obviously is not a good alternative and is not safe either. So 
uh, the fact that housing is so difficult to access, so expensive, um, you know, if, if people have been trapped in a, a violent relationship or with someone who's controlling and coercive, that they, they may not have access to, you know, the money to actually escape these situations. So uh, making, building, you know, public housing um, and making housing more accessible for everyone would make a huge difference in terms of ending domestic violence. Um, another um, another thing could make a huge difference is raising payments like Job Seeker, so that you know if people if women are trying to escape a violent situation, they're able to access some money. There are like you know emergency payments available, but they're actually I think it's more than fifty percent of people who apply get rejected. So clearly, you know that payment isn't you know doing the job that it's needed to do. So those payments could be made more accessible, or even better, Job Seeker, which is accessible. Uh, supposed to be accessible for everyone make that uh, payment high enough that people can live off it and that would I think make a huge difference in reducing uh, the rates of domestic violence in this country which is you know a, a clearly skyrocketing and a, a really um, important issue to address so uh, you know hopefully we can see um, governments take some action following these rallies and hopefully we'll see more um, national weekends of action like this in the future. Now the crisis in Australia's uh, aviation industry has gotten a lot worse, um, particularly as Rex, which is uh, Regional Express Airlines, uh, announced on July 31 that it had gone into administration. So this is the latest airline to go down following uh, the collapse of Bonza, which was another small regional airline in April. So Rex Airlines employees were informed at an all-staff meeting uh, with administrators that 610 jobs were to be going to be terminated. So that's 360 from its capital city operations and another 250 from the regional and rural um, airline. So... Uh, What's happened for now is the city services have been grounded, so any flights between major cities, uh, but the regional services have continued for now. I mean, Rex is one of the main airlines that provides those regional services to the smaller airports across the country. Um, and the Transport Workers Union, which is the union that represents you know, airline workers, um, the National Secretary Michael Caine said it's concerned about the more than 600, uh, more than 600 families that have been left without employment in an industry that has taken hit after hit. And so Kane said uh, federal labour was considering an equity stake, which would serve workers, regional Australia and taxpayers. Um, and they're also pushing for a new regulator, which they would call the Safe and Secure Skies Commission to address, you know, the kind of market dominance of Qantas um, and kind of try to... Uh, address that kind of competition issue and make um, some of the smaller airlines more viable. Um, but these are, I guess I think these are kind of tinkering around the edges and what uh, a bigger kind of bolder solution would be to make Rex public uh, and bring it into uh, public ownership. So, you know, uh, Rex isn't just a transport service. It, it also provides uh, medical and education connections and obviously employment, and it has a big role in, in tourism. Um, and instead of, you know, letting it fall to the wayside or letting some other uh, airline buy buy up those, will take up those flights and um, that uh, money, we should bring Rex back into public hands. So the Greens are supporting this. They've called for it, um, called for nationalising or a, a, a term that I've seen recently, insourcing. Um, obviously, everyone's heard of outsourcing where jobs get sent out of out of house, in, in sourcing, bring it, bringing it back into house, because um, you know these the airline industry problems where that we're having that we're seeing playing out through this uh, Rex issue is go back to um, the privatization of Qantas by the uh, Paul Keating government in 1993. So before Qantas was privatized, it was while it was still government owned, actually had the best safety record of any airline in the world one of the best track records for being on time and also at the same time uh, workers were well paid and, and you know trained and things like that which is really important um, so since Qantas privatized the whole industry 
has, you know, gone down this route. But it's not impossible to uh, re-nationalise airlines. So um, it's happened in New Zealand, it's happened in Argentina, and even uh, kind of a similar example in, in uh, Britain, the new Labour government is planning to re-nationalise uh, the rail lines. So, you know, starting point could be nationalising RECs um, as part of, you know, a, a bigger plan to upgrade and re-establish public transport networks across the country, fast train networks, electric buses, and also obviously acti active transport um, in, in inner cities, so bikes and making uh, it easier to, you know, walk around and get around without cars. Because, um, you know, it's been revealed recently that uh, transport is one of Australia's highest emitters and it's actually on its way up. Um, so it might, might be the highest emitter by like the 2035. Um, so it's really important we've got to reduce emissions um, in transport, particularly from private cars, but uh, also we, we can bring transport into public ownership and make it more efficient and uh, serve people instead of trying to serve profits. So that's a, a story that we'll kind of continue following. Uh, we'll see if, if uh, Labor take on the Greens' suggestion to uh, uh, nationalise Rex. I, I feel like it's unlikely, but it's possible. Um, and, you know, maybe we can go from there. Let's nationalise Qantas again um, and make a, a whole kind of national transport, transport network um, publicly owned. <laughs> Now over to India and student protests have been going on for just over a month after a corruption scandal um, involving India's national testing agency as well as the leaking of exam papers was revealed. So there's almost 3 million students who have been impacted by this revelations that the National Eligibility Entrance Test or NEET has been marred by systemic cheating and corruption. So for, for context, this NEET uh, test is a, is a singular national test for students who want to enter, enter medical, uh, med medical courses at university or dental courses, things like that. Um, and it was actually declared unconstitutional and made illegal by the Supreme Court in 2013. But in 2016, the Narendra Modi government reintroduced the uh, national testing. So... This year, about 2.4 million students took the NEET test, um, and they're competing for about 100,000 places in medical courses. So it's very competitive. Um, obviously, a lot of people, uh, this is their opportunity to, you know, a uh, better life and uh, getting a better income and a, a good job and a secure job as well. So a lot of people, this is a really important test. Um, but as the results came out, which was um, on July 4. Uh, interestingly, only a couple of days after the uh, Indian election, so uh, there's a bit of suspicion that they w released them on that date to kind of uh, keep the news uh, media distracted with the election results while they, uh, so this could kind of slip by under the radar. But the results revealed some real issues. So 67 students achieved the perfect mark, uh, nothing wrong. Um, of 720, um, six of those from the exact same testing center in Haryana state. Um, interestingly, if you look back at previous years, in tw like in 2022, so two years ago, the the top student got a mark of 715, so five marks below that perfect mark. But this year, 715, which would have got you the top mark two years ago, only gives you your two placed 225th. Um, similarly, a score of 700, which in 2022 would have ranked you at the 49th in the country. Um, and then in 2023 would have ranked you 294th, but this year it's 1,770th. So as um, the All India Student Association, which is a student, um, student association connected with the Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist Liberation, said, surely the examination is not getting easier with time or the quality of students appearing for the test recording a quantum jump. So saying, you know, people aren't getting that much smarter all of a sudden, the test isn't getting that much easier all of a sudden, so there must be something else going on. 
So the former ISA national president, Ensai Balaji, told Al Jazeera that one of the issues for the increasing kind of corruption is the centralization of exams. So bringing this into a national testing program, whereas previously the testing was done, you know, state by state or uh, different uh, different institutions ran their own tests for, for entrance. Um, and so that made it kind of more, you know, India is a massive country. So having a national test really kind of erases all the different uh, different kind of environments and situations that people are uh, living in. Also means like people are having to travel really far to do a test. Um, there are stories of people traveling like up to 80 kilometers, spending six hours traveling. And then, you know, basically what's happened is this round of uh, neat testing has been shown is, is not reliable because of all this corruption. So there's calls for, for people to, to retake the tests, um, which, you know, it's important for people to have that option to make it fair. But you can imagine the stress that people are going through this is a really important test they've studied for months probably years to do and now um they have like their testing their results have been called into question they're having to re uh, retake the test um you can imagine the stress so another kind of factor is there's these uh, kind of coaching private coaching tutoring centers have become more and more popular for students but they're very they're also quite expensive so you know, rich students are getting these high quality tutoring, whereas poor students having to just um, study on their own. Um, and I guess part of the, connected to that is the issue of the exam papers leaking. So it's not just that like the exam papers are being put online for free. It's that there's a kind of a racket being set up where, um, you know, uh, kind of coaching centers or corrupt institutions are selling exam papers um, one example, there was one selling for the equivalent of 13,000 US dollars. So that's clearly only something that, you know, rich, well-off students can, can do. So they're already at an advantage and they're using their privilege and wealth to cheat and get even bigger advantage. So it's pretty, you know, pretty corrupt and pretty terrible. Um, and it's all kind of part of this growing commercialization of education, which we're seeing around the world, but in India in particular, following the new education policy 2020, which basically is the Modi government trying to privatize education, make it more expensive for students and more profitable. Um, but also, I mean, I won't go into it too much because it's not quite relevant to this, this story, but the new education policy also involves changing the curriculum to kind of uh, erase important parts of Indian history and promote kind of a Hindu nationalist uh, right wing um, kind of perspective on history uh, so that's also something uh, worth noting um, India's 2024 kind of national budget was released on July 23 and that's continuing that push to privatize education it's cutting spending on education by um, over a million US dollars um, equivalent uh, so now kind of total budget spending on education is about 2.5%, which is well below recommendations of, of 6% uh, bud, uh, spending on education. Uh, higher education also getting massive funding cut of over a million US dollars as well. Um, so kind of in response to this, there's been huge protests across India. There was a week long sit in at, uh, in New Delhi. Um, and it's actually led to the sacking of the National Testing Agency chief, uh, Subod Kumar Singh, um, you know, which is a good step, but it's, it's not enough. Students are continuing to protest. They also want the removal of their BJP education minister, Dharmendra Pradhan, um, and a whole bunch of other things. The uh, National Testing Agency, they want it to be disbanded. Um, the nationalized testing system um, to be scrapped and a return to that kind of pre-2018 um, testing system. And they're also demanding to be re-allowed to take the NEAT test. So uh, there's actually a march on parliament organized on uh, coming up on August 9. Uh, and I think students are going to continue to protest uh, for a fair testing system. Um, I just wanted to mention while we're talking about, I guess, student protests that there's been a continuation of the protests in Bangladesh as well. 
Uh, I mean, it's it's also worth noting that the students in India have held in multiple kind of solidarity rallies and protests in solidarity with students in Bangladesh, uh, as they're obviously right next door. Um, but the 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 I guess to, to briefly outline what's happening in Bangladesh, that the the original protests were about these this quota system where the um, government kind of assigned jobs to uh, uh, kind of uh, people who were um, associated with the government. Um, so it wasn't quite, wasn't really fair. Um, and they kind of wanted this quota system abolished. Uh, so that was the original protest that ma saw massive repression over, I think over 300 students were killed um, by state forces in the, in the uh, protest or, or forces that were kind of supported by the state. Um, including uh, right-wing youth groups. Um, and the protests continued and, and the, the government eventually just agreed to uh, get rid of that uh, quota system or re reform the quota system. Um, but then, so the protests died down briefly. I mean, they also were dealing with a media blackout and basically a 24-7 curfew enforced by the army. Um, but then kind of protests re kind of started up again, calling for justice for all the victims and the families of victims of violence. So all the students who were killed in during the protests. So those protests have really kicked off. And now the Bangladesh prime minister has been forced to flee the country and resign. And the parliament has uh, been dissolved. Um, so it's a huge kind of moment in, for, in Bangladeshi politics. Uh, these protests have been going on for kind of over a month. And um, so the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, has, has fled to India. Um, and it would be interesting to see what happens next. Uh, uh, an administrator has been appointed for to run Bangladesh uh, before, you know, in the meantime, while uh, before elections, new elections are held. So it's a bit of a kind of interesting time to see what will happen next. Um, you know, there's, there's dangers that uh, things could go, like, you know, uh, there could be foreign intervention or a military uh, rule uh, that could take over. But hopefully what we'll see is, you know, the this, you know, huge um, democratic protest movement that's been led by the youth and the students are able to continue to set up, you know, their own, um, their own government and uh, that will rule, you know, on behalf of the people and... Uh, uh, with the people so you know obviously a very developing story um, things are changing very quickly so um, we'll continue to report on this and I think potentially on the next week's episode we'll do a bit of a deeper look into um, what's happening in Bangladesh and, and potentially even have an interview um, with a, a Bangladeshi activist or a, a solidarity activist based in Australia so um, that's kind of all we've got time for this week on the podcast, a bit of a shorter episode this week cause I, I'm just on my own here. Um, so obviously get to your, um, weekend Palestine rallies. Um, they're continuing every week in Sydney and Melbourne and re very regularly in most other cities. Uh, and you know, make sure to check the green left calendar, greenleft.org.au to find out about any upcoming events and if there's anything that's missing on there you can uh you can actually submit events by using the add event option on the website or emailing events at greenleft.org.au um thank massive thanks to sean valenzuela um for providing the music that you've heard on this podcast you can find uh more of his uh, work and his music by going to uh at little archer beats on instagram um and as i said at the beginning if you'd like to help us continue to produce this podcast and um, the Green Left paper and all the articles and stories that we that we produce, then please become a Green Left supporter. You can head to greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Plans start from five dollars a month, um, so it's only uh, a cup of coffee and it makes a massive difference to help us continue. I also just wanted to give a quick plug for Green Left Radio. Um, in uh, where Green Left has a, a weekly radio show on 3CR, which is a kind of a activist working class radio station based in Nam, Melbourne. So you can tune in um, if you're in Melbourne. You can tune into 3CR, or you can go to the tune in on the website 
And all the uh, episodes are published as podcasts as well on 3CR website and on, you know, wherever you listen to your podcast. So if you're listening to this, you know, on Spotify or something like that, you can um, uh, search up Greenleaf Weekly Radio and find that show. And they also um, get some great interview guests and uh, discuss kind of the weekly news. Um, so yeah, that's about all we have time for this week. Uh, and we'll see you next week for a bit of a long episode with another guest. So uh, yes, thanks for listening. Thank you.